Whoops. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hi there. So, welcome on this. Wow, all of a sudden it got chilly out. Yes. Colder, you said. How, how cold was it outside, yeah. Patty? Right now, 50. 50 degrees. Going down tonight to 34. And what was the high yesterday? 80. 80. It's welcome crazy. to Texas. Yes. yes. But we're all nice and warm. Yep. In our homes. I gathered here. We're going to get to start the Gospel of Luke today. Perfect timing since next Sunday is the first Sunday in Advent. Yes, it is. Right? Yeah. So we'll, we'll be spending um, a lot of good time in the Christmas story that Luke has for us in Luke 1 and 2. So it'll be good. It will be good. So what else is new? Um, Let's see. What else is new? Not that much since yesterday, since I saw everybody yesterday. Today, I finally got some motivation. I'm taking down all the fall stuff. And I will be ready to go <laughs> with winter stuff soon. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. I, I get a little crazy and I start taking all the Christmas stuff out when all the fall stuff's still out. And, and I do put yeah, out that's a kinda, lot that's, of fall stuff. Yeah. And then it's all crazy. So this year I said, nope, we're going to. When I say we're going to, it means Patty's going to. Put away all the fall stuff. We, we put up our always spectacular outside Christmas yes, lights. Yes, we did. We did. <laughs> on Saturday. Yes. Figured it was probably time to do it. We, it well, it, it was nice did. and warm. We put up lights where we didn't have to stand on any kind of ladders. Oh, yeah. That was Oh, big. yeah. We, that's, that's, those days are past. Yes. And we are so fortunate. We're in a cul-de-sac, and the, there's a very small strip of property that actually separates our house the way it's on the cul-de-sac from our neighbor. And they have a massive tree in that little sliver, which they get wrapped professionally. And it's this most beautiful, huge tree. And we just... We, we just, enjoy it. We live in the glow. You could go um, read a book by that you can, tree. I mean, honestly. <laughs> and they never turn it off. And just, it's on Is it on right now? Night. Uh, well, I can't tell, honey. It's, you can't see it. But, yeah, I imagine their meter just going like... <laughs> speeding around, speeding around. Well, that's cool. It's but I'm great. excited to start Luke today. Yes, That's it's going to be wonderful. I really, I'm looking forward to this. I yes. think it will be a great journey, and I'm just excited that we get to start it right at this time of year. Yeah, that worked out perfectly. It did. It worked out perfectly. Yes. So, with that, do you want to get started? I sure do. Should I pray? I think you okay. should. Okay, let's pray. Gracious Lord, we are grateful to be here today um, on this admittedly chilly Texas day, but it's okay. It's November, and we... Uh, Grateful that we are warm and and at least virtually together, and we just pray that your Holy Spirit would um, lift us all up today and help us to hear these probably very familiar stories from Luke in a new way, to approach them um, a little deeper than we might have before, and just really strive to hear Luke's proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ. Um, well, all this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, honey, I'm going to go around the corner okay. here to give you some room. All right, I'll get myself slightly reconfigured here. Yeah, and maybe get a little Bible. bit less of a suntan glow on you. Yeah, I can do that. <laughs> I can, yeah, it's kind of amazing, actually, what all that you can do with this. I could turn myself and I could turn this into a black and white picture, you know, but I'm not. So let's see. We're going to begin the Gospel of Luke. So um, let me just tell you a little bit about the Gospel of Luke. The, gos the first Gospel to be written is Mark, probably maybe 64, 65 A.D., about... 35 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. And after, after Paul had written all or almost all of his letters, the earliest writings in the New Testament are not the Gospels. The earliest writings in the New Testament are in Paul's letters. So the earliest writing on Holy Communion, the earliest writing on the resurrection, the earliest writing on Jesus being Lord and, yeah, is, is actually Paul's letters. So Mark is then written in the mid-60s. Then Matthew and Luke both probably come from the 80s. And then John's the last one, maybe the early 90s. 
And so Luke is written um, maybe 50 plus years after Jesus' death and resurrection, which really isn't very long in the scheme of things. I mean, gosh, I was a grown person 50 years ago. Setting that aside is really not very long. And um, uh, we'll see when we begin Luke what his process is. And I will help you see a little bit more or learn a little bit more about how Luke is doing this, how this was done. Luke's gospel is the closest of the four to what you and I might call a biography. Um, the word gospel is just means good news. In Greek, it's the evangelion. It just, just means good news. So each of the gospels is a proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ. But Luke sets out to write something in an orderly manner, um, gathering information as he can, and 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 weave that together into this. Well, you and I would might call it a biography. Now it's not not like the ones we're used to. We never find out, we find out very little about Jesus's um, childhood. Really, just the one story, the Home Alone story, when he was. Um, about 12 or 13. Um, we don't find out what Jesus looked like, any of that. It's, it, you know, for the ancients, that kind of stuff just didn't really, just didn't really matter. When they wrote about people in a biographical sense, they wrote hoping to convince you that this was a person worth listening to. So whether it's Plutarch's lives or Suetonius's lives, um, except for the salacious stuff in them, many of them are written to, 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 to convince you that you need to pay attention to this person. So I think that's kind of what, what Luke is about here. And he is um, the only non-Jewish, as in Gentile, writer uh, in the New Testament. All the other books of the New Testament are written by people who are Jewish, you know, Jewish-Christian, like I talk about. Um, Luke is not. He is a Gentile. Um, it's a safe bet that he traveled some with Paul. Um, and he wrote two books that are in the New Testament, which together comprise a substantial portion because he wrote the Gospel of Luke, which you can think of as Volume 1, and then he wrote the Book of Acts, which you can think of as Volume 2. So you put the two of them together, and you have a very substantial piece of writing about Jesus and then about the early church, focusing on Peter and then later on Paul. So when Luke begins his gospel, he begins it at the temple in Jerusalem. So I thought that I would bring a map, yay, and a few other things about Jerusalem at that time, and we could just look at them, refresh our memory. This will be old hat to many of you, but maybe for some people this is, this is new. This is a map I use many, many times. This is uh, just a drawing, a hand drawing of Jerusalem in Jesus' day. And the red arrow is pointing to the temple, which is at the very center of that rectangular, roughly rectangular, temple complex. Okay? On the north side of it, you can see a structure called the Antonia Fortress. That is the Roman barracks and fortress, which was right there next to the temple. Made it convenient for them to... Uh, be close in case there was there was trouble. Um, but all of this is on the eastern side and the temple proper face, faced east. Um, let me find the right click button here. Here we go. There is the temple proper. The red arrow is pointing right to the center structure. Structure, you are on the eastern side of Jerusalem, and you are looking toward the Mediterranean. You're looking toward the west. And in this huge model, which is at the Israel Museum um, in Jerusalem, uh, you can walk all the way around it. It's just, 
it's just enormous. And the, the, the city is laid out there, and the temple is in the center. Now, understand that this is from 2,000 years ago, right? That's what we're talking about. So, are the maps perfect? Do all the maps agree? Do all the descriptions agree? No. Was there a causeway linking the east side of the temple running across the Kidron Valley? Um, maybe. Some say yes. Some say no. It's just, you you just have to be a little humble uh, about um, your degree of certainty. What we do know, of course, is that the, this whole structure of the Temple Mount was enormous. It was a building project of Herod the Greats. You could fit 23 or so football fields inside of it. And the temple proper, that tall structure in the middle, um, was the equivalent of the Tent of Meeting in, in, in the tabernacle. Okay, the way that is laid out in the book of, of Exodus. So, if I go to the next slide, we have a close-up of the temple because that's where the first real action in Luke's gospel is going to happen. It's going to happen inside those really tall doors. Those really tall doors. I saw a depiction of this once in a movie that was pretty good. I think it was um, the Nativity Story. And and um, it, uh, I thought it was pretty well done, and it showed the you know the immense size of the doors because this structure you're looking at is twice as high as the Dome of the Rock, twice as tall as the Dome of the Rock. I mean, it 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 was enormous. People came from all over um, just to see what Herod had built here, and of course when he died in four B.C., it wasn't even finished. It would be finished in just about time for the Romans to knock the whole thing down. But in any event, there we go. So that is, that. that's the temple itself, and it's through those doors that Zechariah is going to walk in to do his priestly duty, which we'll hear about in a, in a few minutes. All right, so... Most of the other introductory things I could say, talking about priests and so forth, I think I'd rather just sort of embed them in the scriptures when we when we come to them. We'll talk about them. Um, but Patty, is there something else I should talk about? Anything you? Any questions you have? No, no, not, nothing yet, Scott. All good. All good, huh? All good. Okay. So with that, I'm going to suggest that we plunge into Luke chapter 1, verse 1, and as I have been, I have been reading from the NIV, 2011. That, that's generally most of the time what we're using at St. Andrew these days, and, it, and it's perfectly fine. Can you tell us anything, Scott, about Luke who wrote this? Not really. You know, some people will think of him as Luke the physician, we know he traveled some with Paul, but the focus is not on Luke. Indeed, all these writings are even anonymous. One scholar I respect a lot is Ben Witherington at Asbury Seminary. If he were here, he'd want to convince you that Luke was actually Jewish. Yeah, he's kind of alone in that, but, you know, Ben's a smart guy. And, uh, you know, we wish we knew more than we do. We don't know much about Luke. I, you know, I, I think we there are certain things we can infer from even this brief introduction about the man, but uh, maybe that'll come out in these first um, four verses. Because the first four verses are where he is sort of laying out the project, okay? What he is about here. So, he says, chapter 1, verse 1. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of of the things that have been fulfilled among us. So that is a really interesting statement, isn't it? Many have undertaken to writ to to write an account. That means before him, there's the only ones that we have before Luke and Matthew is Mark. Were there other pieces of writing floating around? Seemingly so. Some of them are collected and given a name by scholars as Q because there are places where uh, Matthew and Luke agree, but they, but it's not Mark. 
So where did they get that from? So it just, again, you wish you had all the answers, but we just don't. Um, you could write a fiction novel if you wanted to sometime about the discovery of something something new in an archaeological dig, you know, in Jerusalem or Egypt or somewhere, Turkey or somewhere else that would affect all this. In fact, I think Irving Wallace did in a book in the 60s called The Word when they discovered, I think, it was about a new, an hitherto unknown gospel. But in any event, so he says, many have undertaken to draw an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. Now, even the choice of the word fulfilled is interesting. That's a theological word. If you're just writing, you know, maybe some newspaper account or something that, that you'd like, that, that happened among us or to, that took place among us. But this is a theological idea. And the idea is that Jesus is the fulfillment of what came before, right? Mm-hmm. That, that the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, pointed us to something else, to someone else, someone coming. And now that is, we know that's Jesus. In Mark's Gospel, which written maybe 20 years before Luke, the first words out of Jesus' mouth in Mark chapter 1, verse 15 are, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the good news. So, so Luke says, all right, so these things, they've been, they've been fulfilled among us just as they were handed down to us by those from the first who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. (sighs) Eyewitnesses. In the ancient world, for all historians, anybody who wanted to write history of any kind, Tacitus, any of them, the Greeks, any of them, Herodotus, any of them, the grade A plus 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 golden standard was eyewitness testimony. That's what they wanted. They wanted to 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 talk to people who had been there, whether it was a battle or some other big they wanted to talk to people who had been there. And if you couldn't talk to people who had been there, you wanted to talk to somebody who knew some who had been talked to by somebody who had been there maybe one step removed but it's very different than today where historians go and they collect all kinds of documents and they read everything there is to read and they go through all the official records the unofficial records and people's diaries and all this kind of stuff well in this world none of that exists right there's nothing like that i mean there's the romans kept some records but really that this is an oral culture. We don't live in an oral culture. We live in a written culture. Everything's written down. Um, it might be electronic now, but it's still written down. We have poor memories for the, um, hearing things and remembering them. But not these folks. They live in an oral culture. And so it would be an oral culture, oral, oral um, uh, uh, testimonies, oral witnesses supplemented by things that, yes, they would have written down, some. But the focus is not on the written. It is on the oral. And he's gone around. He, what is he claiming? Um, he, they were handed down to us. That would be Luke and it might just be a royal we. By those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Okay, so he's, he, he doesn't pretend to be disinterested, right? He's talked to eyewitnesses of, these, of what he is about to relate. He, and it's only 50 years later, so there are, there are still some of those around, okay? Um, and, and he's wanted to talk to servants of the word, people, people who, were par, who have been part of this movement. None of this um, really fake, pure, fake, 
pure unbiased approach. Nobody is unbiased. Uh, is, we just can't be. Everybody brings something of themselves to everything that they do. So Luke is up front with it. Here's who I talk to. Um, I talk to eyewitnesses of this, and I've talked to servants of the word. And with this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, he's done his work, right? That's what he's claiming. He's done his work. I, too, decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. Okay, so Theophilus is probably a patron. That is a person of means, maybe substantial means, many means. <laughs> and he has been, uh, and, and helping Luke financially, and giving Luke the financial space to devote time to investigating this and, and then writing it down. So what does that tell me? That tells me that Luke is probably a very competent person. Because you have, if you are this Theophilus and you are a person of means and you're going to, you're going to, you're going to uh, perhaps hire someone to do this, which, is, uh, which I, I think is what is implied in this, you're going to do it. You're going to find somebody who is capable and competent in, who you, in whom you can trust. And indeed, Luke is very much more concerned with some of the particulars about kings and offices and events and stuff than Matthew, Mark, or John. Luke is Luke looks a little different in that way. Um, so, but he has done this for Theophilus. And if most of the scholars who have worked on this for many, many years are correct, he um, he's a Gentile. He's a Gentile. Because, of course, he's writing 50 years into the, or more, into the history of the Jesus movement. Right? Paul, Paul is long gone. He's been everywhere. He's written all his letters. He's been to Philippi and Rome and Athens, and he made the speeches, and that's just been spreading out and out and out and out. So now um, Luke comes along and he is set about to, to put together this fourth Theophilus who is perhaps drawn, I'm speculating now, but perhaps he's drawn to Jesus and wants to know more. And he wants to know the truth. He wants to know what's really, what really happened. So, in any event, so, he says, Luke says, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. Okay? So, yes. So, Theophilus has been taught some things about Jesus, how many we don't know, and Theophilus has put Luke on the job to investigate, to find out, to pull it together. So Theophilus wants to know if he can have confidence in what he has been told. It's, uh, you know, really, I think, you know, Matthew's mission is a little bit like that. You know, people kind of view Matthew sometimes as being, as if Matthew's trying to pro proselytize Jews and get them into the movement. Um, I don't think that's what Matthew's about. Matthew's about convincing the Jews who have come into the movement that they made the right choice, mm. which is a little bit of a different different thing. Um, so, so here he is. Theophilus sends Luke out, and he's on this work, and it will result in these two volumes, Luke and Acts, which were... Did they just sort of, did he write them, delivered with Theophilus, and then they disappeared into the ozone? No. In some process, maybe Theophilus shared them, other people shared them, and it began to be copied and shared, and copied and shared, and copied and shared, and copied and shared, and, copied and, shared, and emerges um, as 
sacred writings God breathed in the same way as Matthew, Mark, and John. From the very beginning, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were accepted as sacred and inspired. Also Acts. Every list contains all of them. Every list contains about seven of Paul's letters. Every, you know, there's, certain, there's a certain core that you just see emerge from the New Testament. Nobody even disputed. The early church took them, used them, loved them, grabbed them, and, and put them to work. So that, that's what Luke is. So I'm often asked, well, all right, Scott, so, but why four? You know, because the truth, I, I think the truth is that you can find places in there where the four writers don't really agree on some of the details. Um, for me, that doesn't matter. How many people ever all agree about details? What, what matters is that in this, you get four portraits of Jesus. So it, it's kind of like if you wanted to write uh, a biography of a person in our world, would you just talk to one person who knew him? No, you'd go out, you'd talk to other people to get a fuller and fuller picture. Well, that's what God has given to us, right? So we have four Gospels, um, and, and they all have their own themes. They all have their own points to make, um, and they're all portraits of the one Jesus. So they are not redundant. They're just not. They're all, they're all helpful uh, to us. Do they share material? Yes. Um, do Luke and Matthew have access to Mark? Sure seems so. Do they have access to some material that's not in Mark? Sure seems so, because there's places where Luke and Matthew agree word for word and it's not in Mark. So when Luke says, I'm going around collecting these things, he's serious. I've gone, I've talked to people, I've collected this, I've collected that, and I'm putting together this, this, this investigation for you, Theophilus. And that's just what he's done. So there you go. So Patty, what else? Okay, I just have one little yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just, um, I, I, I think I know what you're going to tell me, <laughs> but okay. So we go to back to verse two, just as they were handed down to us by those who were first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. So in this case, we are talking about being like the word being the gospel, being servants of what was yes. being, okay. That's why the NIV translators didn't capitalize it. Okay, because I was going to say, yeah. of course, in John, he starts out with, in the beginning was the Word. Yes. Same two words, but definitely referring to Jesus, not... The translators the, don't think he's referring to Jesus, or they would capitalize it. You mean Particularly in, yes, in, in Luke? In Luke, they don't. But in, in, in Luke, they don't. Yes. yes. Because if, if they thought that Luke was referring to Jesus, they would. But here they don't capitalize it, even for the NIV, which tends toward the, you know, the more conservative um, when it comes to translations. Yes. So I think seeing it as servants of the gospel, servants of, is probably the best way to see it, really. The way? The way, the way like it's the being way. spread out mm -hmm. and, and shared, and here we go. Because what's happening is, you know, what is being built, actually, by the Holy Spirit for the community of God's people, what's being built is this library of writings. Yes. All of the writings in the New Testament were completed by 100 A.D. So in a space of 50 years from Paul's earliest letter, which is Galatians or First Thessalonians, to 100 A.D., that's 50 years, um, everything in your New Testament was written. Doesn't mean it's it, it spread everywhere. Doesn't mean everybody agrees about exactly what the writings, sacred and inspired writings were, but, but everything that the community ended up accepting 
was completed by the end of the first century. Um, and by the end of the first century, you're still only 70 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. So by 100 AD, there are still people alive who were alive when Jesus walked the earth. Yes, they would have been very young. But yes. They might have been 10 and now they're 80. Yes, right. That's what they I might mean. have been, they right? Yeah. So they might have been 15 and now they're 85. There weren't nearly as many old people, but people have always lived to be about 100. There always been some. We have many more now. But there have always been, there have always been some. So, is that helpful, Patty? Yes. All right, anybody got anything else before we... Because we, now Luke is going to start... We're plowing in. Yeah. He is telling us what he found. And of course, now, is Luke... Is he stopping to think about how he's going to present this? How he's going to write it? How he's going to structure things? Of course he is. He's an author. Every author does that. You know? <laughs> Every, every every author does that. They all, you know, if you're gonna write a nonfiction thing, you're gonna sit down and you're gonna be organized. You might do a, an outline, and you're figuring out which pieces kind of go where and how you want to do this and what you want to bring out and what you could kind of not spend so much time with. And Luke chooses to begin with the story of a priest and his wife. Okay. So, because they will be, as you know, the parents of John the Baptist. So, G Luke wants to begin with the story of John the Baptist's birth before he turns to the birth of Jesus, because these two men are linked together, right? So, here's what Luke writes. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, this is Herod the Great. This is the Herod, this is Herod the Great. This was the man who was really installed by the Romans in 40 BC as king of Judea, Samaria, Galilee. And he's called great not because he was a super duper kind of guy, but because he built major places, big places. He built Masada. He built Caesarea. He built the Temple Mount. He built Herodium. Was he a good guy? No. He was a terrible guy. Um, his first act, one that really installed him on this throne, um, was he murdered the 17-year-old son of the Hasmonean family, the, the family that preceded uh, Rome, the family that emerged to lead Judea um, in the Maccabean revolt. So, and, and so he was comfortable with violence, comfortable with murder. Um, it's said that he went mad, um, but there's this famous line that one of the biographers says, you know, um, Caesar, that the Caesar back in Rome said of King Herod, you know, you'd be better off being a, a pig than one of Herod's sons because Herod even had his own sons murdered and a wife before he hit the ground in a grave. So that's the guy. And in the time of Herod, Herod the Great, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. Let's pause there. There were a couple, several different groups of priests. There was, and they all traced their lines back to Aaron, the brother of Moses, who, who in turn were part of the tribe of Levi. So, um, Aaron had a son named Zadok, and Zadok was the head of the, shall I say, the more senior priestly line, all right? Um, 
Then there were the Levites in general, who, yes, they were a part of the priestly group, but they did the more mundane tasks required, okay? In the middle, between sort of the dynastic head priest and the, um, and the everyday Levites, there was this other class of priests, of which there were like 20, 20 divisions, of them, and there were a lot of them. It's estimated there were maybe all told, group them all together, 20,000 of them. Wow. 20,000. And and that's that sounds like, okay, is that that many? Well, considering the population of Jerusalem is only 60,000 or so, probably. Yeah, there's lots of them. There are lots and lots of them. And uh, Zechariah comes from this, the division of Abijah. What's interesting, and I didn't know this until I prepped for this class, in the listing of these 20 divisions, Zechariah's division of Abijah is followed by the division of Yeshua, which is the, Jesus' name, because it's just Joshua. That's all Yeshua is. It's Jesus in Greek, or in English, you know, um, Joshua and and so even there, John the Baptist precedes Jesus. Even in the priestly ordering in this, Zechariah is from the division just before the division that would bear the name that Angel Gabriel would say this is to be Jesus' name. I thought that was very cool. It is. Yeah. So that's who he is. Now, does this mean he's a super important kind of guy? No, it doesn't mean he's a super important kind of guy. There's, he's just one of a lot of guys who are who have their little priestly job and supported and however they were supported in his particular you know grouping within within the uh, <laughs> priestly group. Now his wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Wow! So she also comes from a priestly line. Okay, so we have Zechariah from a priestly line, his wife from a priestly line. That is, let me tell you, that is pretty serious stuff. They're a power couple. Well, <laughs> I don't know, but let me just let me just talk about their their setting aside issues of pow, of money, wealth and power and all that kind of stuff. The fact that they both come from a priestly line really does elevate their status a lot, okay? Status in this world is not about money. Um, for the Jews, it was the, there was this priestly connection, right? And so, all right, so you have these two people, both descended down the line from the line of the priests and so forth. It's, it's okay, they are, you know, they are kind of special. Both of them, verse 6, both of them were righteous in the sight of God. Now that righteous means, you know, they to like, okay, do the right thing. But it has a more particular meaning that comes from the Hebrew scriptures. A righteous person is a person who follows the law of Moses with a pure heart. They don't do it begrudgingly. You know, I don't want to do this, but I'll do it. They do it out of a good heart, out of a pure heart. And that is said here of Elizabeth and Aaron. In, Gos in, in Matthew's gospel, it is said time and again about Joseph, Jesus' stepfather. So. You meant Zechariah, but you did say Aaron. What did I say? You said both Elizabeth and Aaron. Yeah, I'm Elizabeth and Zechariah. Zechariah. So I'm probably my eye is probably falling on the word Aaron. Here. I know. You're yeah, that's okay. Missing that one spot. No, right there. nope, nope. It's just I don't know. Just a senior moment, now, darling. I have so many of them now. I lose track of them. <laughs> Verse six. So both of them were righteous. So all right. So they priest, priestly line, priestly line. They're both righteous, and these are good people that had status in front of others. 
because they were righteous. They were seen by others as following the law of Moses with a pure heart. The husband from a priestly line, the wife from a priestly line. You figure that blessings must just be pouring out on these people. Because they were observing, look at the last half of verse 6. Observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. I mean, really. <laughs> then verse 7. But they were childless. And boom. It's like, boom, the hammer falls. All the status, all the righteousness, all of that, observing the commands blamelessly, and they have no children. In the ancient world, that was 100% seen as the woman's problem. She was, in the old words, she was barren. And it was a burden on a woman in two ways three ways because of the shame it brought on her it brought why shame shame because she must have done something to offend god such that god kept her womb closed and did not allow her to have children secondly she just missed out on the joy of children right so this couple who are 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 um we're about to hear are very old That's been a great sadness in, in their lives. And of course, if, if, you, if, if you know the Old Testament, then you know that, well, there were other barren women, weren't there? Sarah. Abraham and Sarah. Sarah, Sarah they were childless and they were really old. And they laughed at the idea of Sarah getting pregnant, but she did, Right? The, the, the closest tie to this, really, as we'll see, um, is probably to Hannah. Hannah is, is the mother of Samuel. When the book of Samuel opens, she is married, but she can't have children. She isn't having children, and she's being lorded over by another wife of her husband who does is having children, and she goes to the goes to the tabernacle and she prays and she prays and she prays and she vows to God, if you give me a son, I will I will essentially give him back to you in your service. And God does. And that son is Samuel. Right? The first, really the first great prophet at the time of the judges. That's Samuel. Um, interestingly, that is why Arthur and Becky's son is named Samuel. She had, the, we went to um, uh Shiloh in Israel, and the, they were so moved by this story that they named their first their first child, a son, Samuel. So we have these stories of women who are childless and are rescued from their childless, as it were, by whom? By God. By God. So if you know your Old Testament stories... about women who had not born children, then you're ready, you're kind of primed to be thinking, okay, something's, something's gonna come of this for these two. Because go on, look at this. It's almost like a replay of Abraham and Sarah, but they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. Mm -hmm. So whenever I teach this, and I have, you know, I'm doing, or I used to do when I, when I preached, and I would preach about it, yeah, I'd have a picture of a really old guy and a really old woman. All wizened and gray, you know, and wrinkled and everything, and, and you know, so just to drive home the point. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't even just say they're old. It doesn't even just say, like, they're past childbearing years or something. They're both very old. <laughs> old, old, and old. But now, God does work in amazing ways, and he has before. So what are we being prepared for? Verse 8. Once, when Zechariah's division was on duty, 
So in the handing down of the priestly duties from one of these 20 divisions to the next over the course of the year, or however long they broke it down, um, he was serving as priest before God. Most scholars would tell you that this was probably a once-in-a-lifetime um, privilege of Zechariah's. There were so many priests that this might have been, this might be the first time that his name came up where he would be the one to go into the temple. Remember those big tall doors I showed you? To go into the temple and um, and and do the priestly duties, do the things that the priests do inside the temple, you know? Um, and so it's his day. Now he was chosen by Lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. Why did they do it by lot? To make you it, run into this many times in the Bible. Why by lot? Maybe thinking that that's who God actually yeah, chose exactly. to do it. Yeah, exactly. It's like rolling the dice. I'm going to roll the dice, and God will make the dice come out the way God wants them to. So they're sort of turning the decision about who's going to be priest each day over to God for that day. But still, there were so many. Um, I've, I've just read a number of scholarly accounts of this who say, look, the man probably is on his first time to do this. So anyway, he's chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood and he to go into the temple of the Lord and to burn the incense. You know, incense is... Incense is not something I care for very much. You know, uh, I, I know people do, but... I, I never really cared that much for the scent of incense. But, you know, it would be the idea is that the priest is sending up an aroma that is pleasing to God. And that God would smell it and God would be pleased. You know, it's so funny that in the, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew, we come across a phrase, God is slow to anger. This always cracks me up when I have to think about this. God is slow to anger. In the Hebrew, it's actually God has a really long nose. <laughs> because from the time that he smells trouble, he has time to kind of cool down before he does anything about it. So he's slow to anger. Yeah, actually, truly, it's one of those euphemisms uh, in 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 the Hebrew. That just is it's just just funny to me. So they're going to burn the incense. It's going to be a pleasing aroma to God. This is the kind of thing they send priests in to do. And remember, this is hard for us. The temple, the priests, the sacrifices that would happen there, those are all the very center of this religion. Not rabbis, not synagogues, not even the written word. It is the temple, the priests, the sacrifices. That is the beating heart of Judaism in Jesus' day. And it would be until the temple is destroyed in 70 AD. When the temple is destroyed, then Judaism changes. It has to because there's no temple, there's no priests, there's no sacrifices. So it becomes a religion built around rabbis, synagogues, and, well, where two or three gather together to study Torah, there is God. That's what it becomes, but that's not what it is in Jesus' day. In Jesus' day, the closest you can get to that is the Pharisees. Um, so, after the temple is destroyed, Judaism really, really becomes what scholars would call a, a Pharisaic Judaism. Because it, it's much more like what the Pharisees taught and did because there was no temple after 70 AD. And no more priests, no more sacrifices. So it was all gone. But now, right here, I mean, Jesus isn't even born yet. It's probably about 6 AD or so. Oh, sorry, my mistake, 6 BC. Okay, I know the calendars are messed up. You should think it would be year zero, but it's not. 
they just made some mistakes along the way, and after a while, things get uh, too hard to change. So it's probably about 6 BC is the year we're talking about here. So, verse 10. He's gone in, he's gotten himself all ready, he's got, you know what he's wearing, don't you? He's wearing his very best. Maybe they had to pull a little saving money out of out of the pot to go make sure that Zechariah is really just in his, as we used to say, his Sunday best. And he goes into the temple of the Lord and he burns incense and verse 10, and when the time for the burning of the incense came, all the assembled, assembled worshipers were praying outside. So here's the scene that you need to have in mind. He's going to go through the double doors. Everybody else is going to be gathered outside. Now those shorter double doors, right? Can you see it, Patty, before the tall um, double doors, the wooden doors? Yes, now we can. Yes. Yeah. So if you, if you look at those, the women are going to have to be on the outside of those. Even on the outside of the little doors? The little doors. Okay. That's as far as women could go. Okay. So if, if this crowd includes somebody like Elizabeth or other women, they're only going to be able to get as far as those double doors. Right? Okay. They're going to be outside in this more outer area. And that's probably where the whole crowd is gathered because there's more space and more room. But in any event, a big moment, big moment. So he's inside, he's going to burn the incense, and all the folks are gathered praying outside, right? You know it's all of his friends and his family. This is a big deal. Verse 11, Then an angel of the Lord an angel of the Lord and appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense. So picture him. He's standing there in front of the altar of incense. Just picture a table. That's what he's burning incense on. On the right side to buy his right hand. Um, well, I guess I'm not sure actually which right side it is, but in any event, on the right side of the altar stands this angel. Well, when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and he was gripped with fear. Of course he is. He knows he's the only one in the place. Who is this? The angel probably has. Does the angel have wings, Patty? No, no, sure the angel doesn't, doesn't have wings, <laughs> but there's probably still something um, unworldly about the appearance of the angel. And especially since no one else is allowed in here. No one else is allowed and in all there. All of a sudden, this angel appears. This, the, who would who would appear to Zechariah as a man? Yes. Right. Um, so Zechariah is startled. He's gripped with fear, and before. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid. Standard vocabulary for angels. Nine times out of ten, when they show up in the Bible, the first words out of their mouths are, do not be afraid. Because the people are afraid. Of course they are. The angel knows this. Their, their fear is understandable. They're encountering something that they never imagined that they would encounter. So the angel says, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear a son, and you are to call him John. Wow. I guess none of that is really that big a surprise. I don't know. If we're told they're very old. So maybe they had prayed for a child, prayed for a son for many, many years. And then stopped. I would guess, being people, I guess I think, you know, when they when they knew that they were really, really old, past the years that people have children, they probably stopped. You know, but here an angel is saying, your prayer has been heard. It, it should tell us something about 
the fact that even when we go year after year after year praying, thinking we are unheard, it doesn't mean we are actually unheard, right? It just means the time hasn't come. Here it is. Because God could have come to them 30 years before and given them a son. But no, now is the time. Now is the right time. Why is now the right time? Because this son is going to grow up to be the one who announces the arrival of, of, of the Messiah. That's why it's the right time. But of course they were praying. Because being with that being without children is is a sad. It's not only a sad thing; it's 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 dangerous because they don't have anybody to look after them in their in their old age. So, the angel says, "Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. Not an unusual name at all. Very, there aren't many New Testament names to begin with." Um, uh, not many names used by the Jews of Jesus' day, I should, would be a better way to put it. You're to call him John. And he will be a joy and a delight to you, I bet. And many will rejoice because of his birth. Okay. Easy to see why he's going to be a joy to Elizabeth and Zechariah. But why are many going to rejoice at his birth? And then the angel tells him, well, why are a whole bunch of other people going to care? For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will, he will do what? In a vernacular, do big things for God. He will be great in the sight of the Lord. Mighty in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink. So that is part of the Nazarite vow. Taken by Samson, taken by Samuel. It goes back to Numbers 6. Um, uh, when we went through the book of Judges, we saw in the story of Samson the issues around that vow. Um, and so John the Baptist is going to be raised under that vow. Um no no wine, no fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. You know, in New Testament language, in Christian language, we are filled with the Holy Spirit when we come to faith in Jesus Christ. And in the New Testament, there's a very strong presence of the Holy Spirit throughout the scriptures in the New Testament. The Holy Spirit is, of course, present before Jesus. I mean, there, there is, the Holy Spirit is God. God has always been, is now, and always shall be. So the Son always has been, is now, and always shall be. The Spirit is, how always has been, is now, and shall be. The same is true of the Father. But the Spirit is not as evident um, in the Old Testament as in the New. And here, the Holy Spirit is going to, to fill this child before the child is even born. And I'm thinking of my brain is going to Jeremiah, who is called by God even when Jeremiah was in the womb. You know, that should shape our thoughts about things like abortion, right? Here is John is going to be filled with the Holy Spirit before he's even born. Like Jeremiah, you know, known before Jer while Jeremiah was known but by God while Jeremiah was still in the womb. Going on about John, he says, he will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. See, Elijah is one of the great prophets in the Old Testament, not one of the writing prophets. There, aren't, there is no book of Elijah. 
but you get the story of Elijah in in the book First Kings, which I'm going to be starting in a few couple of weeks in on on Tuesdays. Um, you get the story of Elijah, and it's a powerful story. And Elijah is a powerful prophet for God, bringing God's word to God's people, demonstrating God's word for God's people. And uh, as you know, probably know, Elijah in the book of Kings does not die. It, he, he's taken up to heaven in a fiery chariot, yeah, but there's nothing recounted about his death. And so, not surprisingly, I guess, there were a lot of Jews in Jesus' day who th were expecting the return of Elijah. And in a way, that's happening. John the Baptist is, is Elijah returned in that sense. Okay? He is going to be the one who speaks for God. He is going to be the one to announce the coming of the Messiah. John will spell all this out for us himself when we get that far. But for now, um, the angel's telling Zechariah these these amazing, stupendous things. He will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. Right? What are those both focused on? Relationship. Um, wisdom. The doing of things in God's way. That's what that's what it means to be righteous. To be righteous is to, is to do things in God's way. And the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous and the hearts of parents to their children. Um, you know, doesn't that strike you as kind of funny that the angel would say, turn, turn the hearts of parents to their children? It strikes, strikes me as funny. Strikes us, I think a lot of us probably, is funny because we live in a time when the world revolves, seems to revolve around children. The idea that you'd have to turn a parent's heart to their children seems funny. Odd. Not, not as it is. However, their world is not our world in this regard. Children, half of the children born did not live past the age of five. Children were generally seen as burdens because they had to be fed. It's it's a different it's a different thing now. Now the Jews were somewhat different from their neighbors in this. Um, Roman in the Roman world they practiced infant exposure, which is where if you didn't want to keep your child, the husbands could say, "Well, take the child out and leave the child under a tree, and somebody would come along and get him." We have no no record, nothing in the writings of any kind that indicate Jews practiced infant exposure, but still, their life with children is not our life with children, is my point. But the overall purpose of John, this child who is yet to be born, who will be filled with the Holy Spirit before his birth, is in that last phrase, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord, for the Lord. And of course, you and I know who the Lord is. Yes. Who is the Lord that, that the angel is speaking of? Jesus. Jesus, exactly. Jesus. Um, so, even before his birth, he is filled, John is filled with the Holy Spirit and he has a vocation. He has a mission. He has a purpose. And all of this has been revealed to his father by an angel standing right there in front of him. Wow. Verse 18. Ze Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I'm an old man. And my wife is well along in years. Meaning we're too old. We're, who are, we're Abraham and Sarah. But you see, 
What mistake is Zechariah making? His mind is probably blown, and he has forgotten all about Abraham and Sarah. Yes. And he's forgotten about Hannah, and he's forgotten about Rachel, and he's forgot forgot about these other ancestors of his own who were burdened with their childlessness and then were rescued by God. Perhaps if he remembered on the spot Abraham and Sarah, he wouldn't, he wouldn't say, oh, come on, how can I be sure of this? He would trust the angel implicitly. Which is what, what, that's really what God wants from us. We Christians kind of mess that up a lot. We, we, you know, if you ask somebody, well, what does Jesus want from you? Oh, man, we start to load it up with stuff. And, and it's, a lot of it's good stuff. Sure, sure. Um, evidence of fruit of the Spirit. Sure, 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 sure. All out, a lot of good stuff. But when you get to the heart of it, what does Jesus want from us? That we will trust him implicitly that we will trust him with our lives, that we will trust him with our stuff, we will trust him with our families, we will seek, seek him, trust him, put our faith in him because Jesus knows that there is no other place. There is no one else. There is, there isn't, there isn't. And so what does, what does, what does God want from Zechariah right now? <laughs> he just wants Zechariah to look at the angel and say, okay, let's go. And who will do that? You know, you know these Christmas stories. Who will do that? Who will simply say, let it be. Mary. Let's go. Exactly, Patty. And, and Joseph. Mary, Actually. yeah, but yes, Joseph too, but Mary famously, yes. when she says, well, let it be. Just, okay, okay, let's go. That's what Zechariah should have done, but he doesn't. Well, yeah, well, I let's know. kind of be honest here. They do, t you know, we get this little introduction to about Zechariah and Elizabeth, that, that they are both really good people yes. and righteous in God's eyes. Yes. But what he's being told is just so outrageous that it's just yes. hard for him. You know? I'm, I will grant you that. I will grant you all of that, Patty. And he probably but, doesn't put himself in this. Day. I know you said like, well, if he thought, thought to himself, think about Abraham and Sarah, but maybe Zechariah is just such more of a humble man where he can't even think to compare himself to that well i'm not them oh or, my gosh we're talking maybe, about abraham or maybe on this particular day when he's all dressed up in his best priestly dudes he's not humble enough could be yes see because yeah. who does get it this humble 14 year old girl from galilee right right so and i hear you patty but in any event, God knows our heart, right? Yes, he does. So the angel said to him, <laughs> I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. That's who I am. <laughs> I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. Dude, <laughs> Dude, come on, come on. And now, you will be silent, which means mute in this case, and not able to speak until the day this happens. Because you did not believe my words. You did not trust my words. That word, that believe word there, that's pistis underneath. You did not have faith. Now, we could argue about whether the reasons he might not, but God knows our heart. God's expectation of Gabriel is that, of Zechariah is that he will simply say yes, as indeed Mary does. So, I mean, it's, all that's going to happen is that Zechariah is not going to be able to speak. 
now for guys, that's not that big a burden anyway, right, Patty? <laughs> I mean, really? <laughs> yeah, really. Okay, you know, sure, no problem. <laughs> I have an excuse for not speaking to anybody. <laughs> Because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Of course. How do we know they're going to come true? Because the words are coming from God. Yeah. I mean, angels, the, the word in Greek is angelos. And it means simply messengers. They're messengers from God. They are like telegram carriers. Okay, you might, I, I don't really remember telegrams. I think my mom got a few when I was a kid. But, uh, you know, yeah. The angel shows up and the angel is speaking, is essentially speaking for God. Really, in a way, beyond what the prophets actually do, I think. I think that there's there's a more of a direct thing. Because this, this is actually, remember we met when, when this began? It was an angel of the Lord is how this whole thing began. An angel of the Lord shows up. Well, wow, okay. So, but now, Zechariah, you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words which will come true at the appointed time. So we're going to stop there because what's Zechariah has heard all of this stuff. He can't speak about it. And the whole crowd is waiting for him outside. So what will come of that? But the key thing is to see this John the Baptist, Jesus, the connections. Um, it's, it's a, the, it's, I think if we didn't have Luke's gospel, we would not have nearly as deep an appreciation of John the Baptist as we as we do. Okay, so yeah. anyway, we'll we'll pick up there next week. Yes, it it is it is sad. It's kind of like we we talk about that we wish we knew about Jesus more. We've got his birth. We've got the twelve year old story. Right, and then we have his. He's 30 uh, years old yes. when he right, hits the scene. And it kind of is what happens with John the Baptist. Yeah. We've, we we know he's going to be born. We know what happens when the babies sort of meet. meet. Yes. And next thing we know, he's in the Jordan River baptizing people. Yep. And we don't know. And wouldn't it be interesting if there was a gospel of John the Baptist and he told his, his adventure? I would bet you somewhere in ancient writing, somebody had some fun and wrote one maybe they did yeah I, I doubt they had access to to anything you know in particular but yeah because it is because we want to fill in the pieces yes. that's why you know even um even though you might call this sort of like an ancient biography they just weren't like what we write now right even, even the ones by plutarch and suetonius the lives of the caesars and all that stuff they're not really like what biographers strives to do now right um and so with jesus so many of the questions we might have we just don't get answered but someday i'm going to find out yes from yes. the man himself the man. <laughs> yeah and you, you almost even wonder we know that they're distant cousins of some sort they're kin and so you want to know like over the years did Families get together sometimes. Did one they were all went to Jerusalem together? Where you know maybe for one of the the uh, festivals? Did John the Baptist? Um, when Mary's in trouble, who trouble. does she go to? Yeah, she goes to Elizabeth. Yes. So you would think yes. that you know so that that, that may would be. just be all very interesting. Yeah, it would you know, be all interesting because otherwise you wonder how did he know right at that moment to be preaching that you know Jesus was going to be coming it sounded like very well, there soon is, there is god at play here you know? we, we do know that yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway i'm just saying yeah. it would be it would just be so cool to find out exactly what happened and as you always say somebody out I can there sit write down, a novel <laughs> i can sit down with john the baptist and ask sit, him sometime they, yes you know after i'm up there with yeah. with him but then you couldn't share it you know yeah unless how do you know i can you. share it True, I don't know. 
<laughs> I think we better pray. I think we probably okay. should. Okay. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you, God, for Scott's teaching, the start of a whole new a whole new wonderful book, and it's a gospel, Lord, so we're excited about that. We uh, pray, God, this week for everybody's uh, safety and good health, God, as we come together. Um, sometimes just a small group, maybe even be just a solo person, but we come and we remember, God, on Thanksgiving to thank you for all the wonderful things, God, that you have done for us, um, including sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die for us, Lord. We are so grateful, Lord, for that. We pray, God, that you would hold this group close and bring us back together next Monday to continue along in the story, God. Um, again, we are truly, Lord, we are very, very grateful. And um, just help us, God. Sometimes, you know, we allow that to just kind of slip out of our mind for a, a moment or two and uh, for us to always just be so grateful, God, for all that you have done for us. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Adios, everybody. Hope everybody has a wonderful, wonderful Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. And hope to see many of you tomorrow. Tomorrow. At yeah, the... we're getting awful close to the shipwreck tomorrow. Oh. Malta. Oh. oh, yeah. Big doings. Okay. Bye, <laughs> Bye, -bye. y'all.